I'm Demetri Duckett, Managing Partner at Known, where I lead the Catalyst Funds uh, from Living Cities. Uh, Living Cities is a collaborative of over 19 of the world's leading foundations and financial institutions dedicated to ensuring that all people in U.S. cities are economically secure and building wealth, living abundant, dignified, and connected lives. At Known, my team and I, along with all of our colleagues, are uh, really focused on being a proper new majority financial growth firm that empowers the multi-trillion dollar economy that sustains our way of life. With that, I'd like to welcome Justin Ladner to introduce himself. Dimitri, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to SOCAP for hosting this webinar and thank you to the audience for joining us today. Uh, my name is Justin Ladner. I am a senior policy advisor on AARP's thought leadership team. And to give a little bit of background uh, about myself, my, my sort of major role at AARP is to oversee what we call our longevity economy research portfolio. It's basically all the work that we do that investigates the economic activity and the economic contributions of people 50 and older, both in the United States and around the world. So today I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things, or the major theme of the presentation is gonna be about older adults as consumers and workers. And in order to talk about that, I'm gonna bring in a few different areas of our recent work. One is a uh, large scale report called the Global Longevity Economy Outlook. Um, and that talks a lot about older um, adults as consumers and how their consumption um, in individual economies and around the world uh, contributes to economic activity like the production of goods and services, um, the, the employment of people and the labor income that they earn. So I'll start by talking about that. And then I'm gonna to shift to some additional work that looks at older workers well, older adults as workers, basically what kind of contributions they make in the labor force. And all that work is going to be U.S. focused. Um, and then uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to have a conversation and, um, and hopefully get some really interesting uh, questions from, from you, the audience. We're really excited. So um, to, to kick things off, um, I want to first talk about older adults as consumers. So a general uh, sort of point here is that the 50 plus population around the world is already a critical consumer group, already accounts for a huge share of consumer spending around the world. Um, and that share is rapidly rising over time. And to illustrate that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll first sort of talk about the uh, broad overview. So in 2020, um, we find that 50 plus households, that is households headed by somebody 50 or older around the world, they accounted for an actual absolute majority of spending. Um, about 50.3% of global consumer spending around the world. Um, and we project that to rise significantly over the next 30 years, all the way up to almost 60%, 59% um, in 2050. I, I think, so first off, I think that share really surprises people just as a, an, an overall kind of um, message about the contribution of older consumers. Um, but another thing that really is surprising about, about this finding is that it's not about older consumers spending um, a very large amount of money in any particular category. It's actually that older consumers represent um, a huge share of spending across every category. So for example, if I break up total spending around the world into 12 major product categories, which are, are listed here in this figure, you see that older consumers actually make um, already account for a huge share of spending in all of those categories, and that these shares are all projected to grow uh, in many cases very rapidly over time. In some cases, um, the category is something that you might intuitively expect. So for example, consumers 50 plus already account uh, for about 60% of spending on uh, in, the, in the health product category. That's not su so surprising. It's also not surprising that it's gonna grow over time. But consumers 50 plus also spend uh, an, uh, already a clear majority in recreation and culture, um, in, in housing, um, in, in a diverse uh, variety of categories. Basically every product that you might imagine selling uh, an older consumer uh, is going to be a big group uh, for, for, for that product, both now and in the future. So what does the effect of this uh, spending have on, on, on GDP, on, on the production of goods and services, basically? Well, first off, it's already very significant. So if I think about global GDP in 2020, the spending of uh, consumers 50 plus accounted for over a third of that production of goods and services, 34 percent um, in, uh, in, in 2020. Um, it's going to grow to nearly 40% in 2050, uh, about 39% of, of global GDP in 2050, we project will be um, will be generated by the spending of older consumers. And once again, this is spread across a wide variety of industries. So if I break down total GDP into GDP by different sectors, um, I once again find that older consumers are making huge contributions here. Uh, and also, once again, this is something where um, certain categories, you may you maybe expect that. So real estate, as an example, older consumers already account for over half of GDP in the real estate industry, and that's projected to grow over time. 
Um, but again, it also extends to um, to other industries that you would not necessarily associate with older consumers. Art, entertainment, and recreation is one example. Um, transportation and storage, it's a rapidly growing area for older consumers and their impact on GDP. Um, so there's basically this, the, the broad message here is that we already have um, the production of goods and services relying very much on older consumers, and that reliance is going to grow rapidly over time. So that was just a very, very uh, brief overview of our findings from the Global Longevity Economy Outlook Report and the effect of older consumers um, on the global economy. Um, now I want to turn and talk about workers, because this is another area where um, older adults have become a, a, a already significant and very, very rapidly growing um, contributor um, economically. So first, um, I want to talk about uh, this section. Th this figure comes from a recent article that we published on uh, with a, the title of the article is called Thinking Beyond Prime Working Age. And it's talking about the 55 plus workforce in the United States and, and its contribution um, and, and how that contribution has changed over time. So in this particular figure, we're looking at uh, the share of full-time workers that are 55 and older. And we break that down to in three different categories, 55 to 59, 60 to 64, and 65 plus. Uh, the full-time workforce is an interesting group to focus on. Uh, because they tend to have a really high labor force attachment. And for that reason, uh, they tend to be really important, sort of over, uh, sort of overrepresented in terms of their importance in the production of goods and services, in terms of their importance in supporting households and paying taxes. A lot of different economic activities are really dominated by the full-time workforce. So focusing here um, really illustrates how older workers have grown in that capacity over time. If I go back to 1992, which is really not very long ago, just a generation ago, um, we find that fewer than one in nine workers, uh, fewer, than, fewer than one in nine full-time workers were actually in this category, the 55 plus category. And if I, if I break that down by age group, I find that 65 plus workers were a, were a tiny fraction of the full-time workforce, less than one in 50 full-time workers in 1992 were 65 plus. Um, that has changed dramatically over time. This is really an unprecedented shift historically if we think about the, the growing representation of 55 plus workers in this full-time workforce. Um, it grew slowly initially between 1992 and 2002, and sort of nudged up to 13.3% of the full-time workforce. And then it has exploded since then. It's grown, it grew to over one in five workers, full-time workers in 2012, and continued to grow despite the pandemic um, in 2022. In 2022, we have that nearly one in four full-time workers are 55 plus. And the vast majority of this growth has occurred because of workers that are 60 and older. So if I look at the individual groups here, I see that uh, workers that are 60 to 64, their representation in the full-time workforce has more than doubled uh, since 1992. And if I look at the 65 plus, it's more than tripled from 1.6% to 5%. So these are huge changes. If I project forward, we see that those changes are, are expected to continue over time. So this is um, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, they have a, um, a uh, report that they put out every year, a data set called uh, the Employment Projections Data Set. So this is their latest version. It goes from 2022 to 2032. And what you see here is an evolution of the U.S. labor force and its age distribution over time. So if I go back to 2002, you see that the vast majority of workers were 16 to 54. 86% uh, on those were 16 to 54 uh, in, the, in the labor force. Only uh, about 14% were 55 plus. Again, that's changed very dramatically over time. It's now nearly a quarter or 55 plus. Um, and this is the overall labor force. And if I look within that 55 plus window, both now and, um, and in the future, I see that there's a huge shift in, 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 in who 55 plus workers are. So in 2002, uh, nearly 80% of workers that were 55 plus were in a very narrow age range. They were 55 to 64. Um, so they were sort of tr below that traditional retirement age of 65. And that's changed really dramatically between 2002 and 2022. Now, um, almost 30% of, uh, of workers that are 55 plus are in that category of beyond that, sort of, that traditional retirement age of 65. Um, and if I project forward just in this next decade, between 2022 and 2032, um, that fraction is going to grow tremendously. If I, In 2032, the BLS projects that uh, nearly, or actually slightly over 35% of workers that are 55 and over will be beyond that retirement age of 65. They'll be 65 to 74, or they'll be um, 75 plus. So this is really, again, a huge change over time. Now, I wanna, before we go on to our, our, our questions and, and our discussion with, with Dimitri, I wanna talk uh, just very briefly about what this means. Um, it means a lot for policymakers, it means a lot for um, society at large, and of course it means a lot for businesses. And so we have a set of recommendations, a set of strategies for sort of capturing the economic opportunity offered by the global longevity economy. Um, and here I'm gonna focus just very quickly on two of those things. 
First is just tapping into the global population of older uh, consumers, understanding that they're a huge part of spending already and that that's going to grow very rapidly over time. So if you're thinking about developing a product or service, um, it, thinking about older consumers is really a necessary component to your success. Um, another thing is just to consider aging and longevity a business imperative. This, in, this includes that idea of thinking about your consumer base, but also about your workers. Who are you hiring? Where is your talent coming from? Increasingly, that's coming from uh, an older population whose behavior in terms of when they want to work, how much they want to work, uh, what age they want to retire, has all changed very, very substantially over time. So thinking about that business imperative and thinking about how those changes fit into your business is going to be critical to success going forward. And with that, I'll conclude this presentation and uh, pass it back to, me, to Dimitri. Thank you for that presentation, Justin. Very fascinating. I happen to be one of those workers over 55, so I pay particular attention to uh, the evolution of things over time. I still remember being a kid and thinking that 50 was going to be so old, and now so many of my friends um, are still quite active well into their 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, but this conversation fascinates me. You've shared a bit of data with us uh, about uh, things you found in the Global Longevity e Economy Outlook Report. What are some of the things that resonate most strongly for you in terms of helping us really understand the global importance of older consumers? Well, I think one of the biggest things that stands out to me in the report, and, and one of the surprises, even for us as we were doing the research um, and compiling the report, um, was the diversity of impact for, for, for older consumers. I, I think that there is a, a long-running stereotype about what an older consumer is in terms of what's, what they spend money on um, and, and kind of what their behavior looks like in general. Um, and we found that that is absolutely not the case. If you look at a place like the United States, already over 56% of consumer spending is coming from 50-plus households. Um, that includes majority shares in a wide range of product categories, uh, including many things that you would tend to associate with younger consumers. And globally, that is also true. And the rates of change that we're seeing over time are really dramatic. So a huge, I think, surprise in this report, even for us, coming from a point of view of, of already recognizing the importance of older consumers, was how diverse that spending is and, and how impactful it was across a range of product categories and a range of industries. Fascinating. In our work uh, through the Living Cities Funds, particularly at Dome, we paid attention to a lot of shifting demographics. Uh, I think forward to 2045, when the ethnic and racial makeup of the U.S. will be completely different than it is today. And for the first time, we'll have a, a population that is more than 50 percent people of color. Similarly, you've shared some things with us about aging populations and the dynamics. What about some of the younger parts of the world? You know, how are business leaders, policymakers and other people dealing with, um, you know, sort of what it means to have younger populations and still consider the longevity economy? I think that's a wonderful question and a great point. And another really surprising thing from our report, because we looked at so to, to kind of provide some background for this report, we looked at 76 economies individually, which vary wi uh, wildly in their in their current state in terms of where they are in their demographic transition. So we look at a lot of very young economies. We look at a lot of very aged economies. Um, and in, in, I think you would imagine that we would have found uh, this basic idea that if you're a young economy, the 50 plus population is, is just not that important right now. Um, and that is actually not at all what we find. And there's a few major reasons for that. I I'll, I'll highlight three things. So first off, um, we often find that even in a, an economy that has a very small 50 plus population domestically, oftentimes those households are disproportionately powerful from an economic point of view. So a place like Ghana, for example, um, really stands out. It's a, it's a very young economy, only about 12%, 12.2% of its population is 15 older, yet 50 plus households in Ghana already account for about 40%, nearly 40% of consumer spending. So that's a, that it's for such a tiny population, that's a huge um, share of consumer spending. Um, and it's growing rapidly over time because Ghana is projected to be increasing, um, to, to be aging at a fairly rapid rate. Um, another thing that we find, the, the, the sort of second issue for, for, for these younger economies is that even if you have a very young economy right now, that economy is, is almost certainly aging very, very rapidly. There are uh, very few exceptions around the world. Uh, the rates of aging that we see in certain parts of the world are completely unprecedented in a historical sense. Southeast Asia is a fantastic example. Um, you have places, um, I often highlight Malaysia as a really interesting case because it has a sort of interesting parallel to the US. 
So if I think back in about the U.S. population, it's aging over time. If I go back to the 1940 census, about 20% of Americans were 15 older in that 1940 census. And by 2020, the 2020 census, we had that about 35.6% of Americans were 15 older. So a significant change happening over an 80-year period of time. In Malaysia, almost an identical change, actually a slightly larger change, 20% today versus about 37% in 2050. That same change is happening in 30 years, so less than half the time. So even if you have a very young economy now, it's it's going to be the case in a, in a short period of time that, that, your, that your population is going to be aged and that consumers that were less powerful just a decade ago are much more powerful um, in the present. So there's that reason. And then finally, a huge reason for thinking about um, the uh, longevity economy as a global um, sort of plan of this global role is the effects that we see through trade. So we see a lot of very young economies engaging in global markets through trade. And for that reason, a lot of their um, domestic production, a lot of their uh, domestic economy actually relies on foreign consumers in other countries. So even if you are a young economy, it's quite likely that um, a lot of your uh, economic growth will depend on foreign consumers, many of whom are older. So for those three reasons, um, all of which I think surprised us a lot and surprised people that we talked to, um, we found that uh, that uh, really any economy, regardless of current age, um, benefits from the longevity economy. Wow. I would love to see data that crosses the uh, the aging dynamic with birth rates, just so we can dig in a little deeper. Mm. But I think that will be another webinar and a conversation for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Justin, you shared that older consumers account for quite a significant fraction of spending. Um, what can you share more about how it's distributed and if there are concentrations we should be paying particular attention to, um, particularly with older consumers? Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of as I, I showed in the, in the um, in this in the presentation. There are a few trends and a few sort of things that you see that you might expect. So if I think about product categories and I think about where older consumers spend money, it's not a surprise, for example, in, uh, that globally older consumers account for a big share of health spending. That's not super surprising. It's also not surprising that older consumers, their smallest spend category tends to be um, in if, both globally and in most economies. Uh, we find that their smallest spend category is education, which, again, is not is not extremely surprising. You would expect education expenditures um, to be concentrated among among younger younger adults um, and, and and even younger adults with children. Um, however, I think the big surprise is that those disparities are not nearly as big as you would imagine. So even though older consumers are not a majority spender for education, they still account for um, a huge fraction of education spending, and that fraction is expected to approach a near majority by 2050. Uh, I think 45 percent on the global scale. In the U.S., it's even a bit higher. Um, so there's surprises like that. There's that diversity of spending where it's not just about a few different categories. Really, older consumers are spending thing are spending money um, increasingly everywhere. And I think underlying this is sort of this concept um, of changing our attitude about what it means to be an older consumer. I think one great thing to highlight, and we actually have an article um, coming out uh, in a, about a month that looks at this issue, is um, one way in which older consumers are changing is through parenting. So parenting historically, if I think back, you know, 50 years in the United States, as an example, um, you would tend to have um, childbearing be very concentrated in, in somebody's late teens or 20s. Um, so the basic storyline would be you have children in your 20s, um, they grow up, they move out of your house. And by the time you're in your mid to late 40s, you're an empty nester and you've got, you know, 15 years before you're retiring. And that's kind of that's kind of what your sort of life course looks like up to that point. Now it's much, much more likely actually that you're going to have people in their 30s, sometimes in their late 30s or even early 40s, having children. And that means that as consumers in their 50s and 60s, they're doing things like paying for college education, buying things that you would never associate with an older consumer, like, like toys or other products for, 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 for young and growing children. Um, and they're going to have other challenges that they're balancing. So, so paying for college, for example, while simultaneously planning for retirement. Basically, that's, this sort of example just illustrates that older consumers are fundamentally different now and will be fundamentally different in the future than what our conception of them from the past has been quite fascinating. I have just uh, celebrated writing my last check for my son in college. So in my <laughs> late fifties, I'm so happy now. Uh, so that does congratulations, <laughs> so many of my friends, and I have this this chuckle of getting them off payroll. Um, so so thank you for sharing that. Um, what does all this really mean for businesses? Though? Like, what can they do to market their goods, services to consumers across age spectrums, which would include me? 
Yeah, well, I think I, I think a big thing that comes out of this sort of an extension of, of, of this prior point, and I think this would actually apply to every age range, um, is to come up with or to sort of understand that consumers are uh, a constantly evolving group of people. Um, the things that they're interested in, the things that are going to draw their attention in their business are changing really rapidly over time. So not thinking about um, any consumer group, including older consumers as a monolith, I think that would be a great piece of advice. Um, really understanding individuals um, and, and constantly revising your expectations. So what maybe was the case 20 years ago for a 65 plus consumer, as an example, that'll no longer be the case um, today. Uh, so you have to kind of constantly engage with your consumer base, constantly try to understand what their needs are um, and be flexible, basically be innovative in that area and understanding how they want to interact with you as a business. Wow. You know, we think about this notion of longevity and working and some of the things that come up are, are people working because they want to work or because they need to work? You know, what are some practical steps that you think would just help us understand a bit more about the economic opportunity offered by the longevity economy and how we can engage with various more mature citizens in our population? So I think with respect to workers, there's a few uh, very important things. I mean, I mean, one thing that we really worry about with with older workers, I'll highlight two two things actually. One thing is uh, age discrimination in in uh, in the hiring of older workers. So that's a very a very well known issue. Is that um, you have if you're if you're somebody who let's say let's say you're somebody in their late fifties or early sixties, you're trying to switch jobs. Um, or you're trying to do something like like reskill because because your current job has sort of become technically obsolete or something like that. There are a lot of barriers to doing that. Um, some of them are financial. Sometimes reskilling can be very expensive, and a lot of resources for reskilling can be targeted towards younger people. So that's a barrier. Um, another thing can be just sort of people's again their expectations about what it means to be a worker at that age. So for example, if you are um, if you're a business and you're looking at a worker who's in their early 60s. Um, a sort of common misconception might be that that person is going to retire in a year or two um, because we all think of 65 as being as being kind of your standard retirement age. Um, today, that's actually um, quite likely to not be the case. We have so many more people now um, than any point in, in past history working well past 65. Um, so I, again, I would sort of encourage um, businesses and, and, and people who are hiring workers to think about um, what does this person as an individual want to gain out of their work? Um, eat, despite their age, they might want to work another 10, 15 years. So that's a big issue. Um, and so so I, I think for, for workers, that's one big thing. Um, another thing for workers is um, understanding that uh, all of our research says, um, and, and, and there's some research that I haven't talked about here uh, that comes out of uh, the multi-generational workforce, is that workers of every age actually like to work with age diverse groups. So younger workers appreciate older workers for their experience and the mentorship that that provides. Older workers really appreciate working with younger workers um, for a reverse mentoring sort of experience because they gain, for example, technical knowledge in new fields. Um, so there's this other issue of um, age diversity itself being a key driver of productivity in, uh, in, in work groups. Wow. So, Justin, as we delve more deeply, I want to talk more about workforce. But before we move on, any other thoughts on the economic opportunity based on the data that you shared uh, in your prior remarks? So, I mean, I, I think broadly speaking, the, the, the major message here is, is um, this idea of innovating and being flexible and evolving to understand the difference um, in how people are changing as consumers um, and how people are changing as, as, as workers. Basically, I think a very broad way of saying this is that um, in business, you have to think about the population that you're serving. And that population is constantly fluxing in terms of its demographics. Um, in this case, we're focusing on this idea that the population is shifting to become older, both the population at large and the population of people who are working. Um, so being dy dynamic in that environment, being um, willing to evolve is a key to success. Well, you raise businesses and policymakers. And one thing we do know, you know, delving in again on the workforce issue, is that the prime working age population, the sort of ages 25 to 54, are often what they completely focus on when thinking about workforce issues. How do you feel about that and what do you think they should be holding? 
<clears throat> so the the prime working age population, just in case um, somebody on the, in the audience doesn't know the definition, it's basically people that are 25 to 54. The concept here is that um, if you're 25 years old, you're you're quite likely to have finished your sort of main education um, and be entering the workforce. Um, and if you're 54, you're probably too young to, to, to be considering retirement. So it's this population of people that has this very high labor force attachment. And historically, um, it is very true that they have accounted for a big fraction of full-time workers. Um, they've accounted for a big fraction of labor income um, and all the things that go along with that, supporting households, paying taxes, all these different things. So it's certainly true that, full, that prime age workers um, continue to be a hugely important part of, of, of the workforce. There's certainly no disputing that. However, again, because of demographic change and because of the changing attitudes of older people in terms of their willingness to work longer, either out of want or necessity or for whatever reason that motivates them, um, they have become a much, much bigger fraction um, of, of the workforce over time. And I think that means um, from a policymaking point of view or from a business point of view, we have to think flexibly about what are the policies that we have in place? What are the practices that we have in place? And do they work for people of every age? So ideally, you would want a system in place where workers of any age in your workforce can attain the resources they need to, to reskill or to upskill, um, to train, to do new things, to evolve as, as workers, to meet whatever personal goals that they have and the goals of your business. Um, having policies and practices in place that work for every generation and not just one single group. I think that's a big message that comes out of the work that we've done in that area. Thank you for that. Um, we've heard quite a bit of stories about falling labor force participation among older adults. Some say the great retirement. So some of that lives a little bit in juxtaposition with some of the data we hear about mm. people working later. Um, how do you think the pandemic might have impacted how people are showing up in the workforce, particularly uh, for older workers? Yeah, you know, I think that there's a, a lot of a lot of trends that came out of the pandemic that are are very very important and also somewhat misunderstood. Um, so one of the big ones um, that, that that you alluded to is this idea that I believe in many news outlets it was called the Great Resignation. This idea that um, because of the pandemic, a lot of workers that were on the cusp of retirement had decided to just end to just end things early, just move into retirement early. Let's say your early 60s, I'm just going to push forward my retirement a little bit. Or maybe if I was already working past 65, maybe that no longer makes sense for me and I'm going to retire. And it is certainly true. If I look at the labor force participation of people that are 65 and older, it has dropped importantly um, relative to right before the pandemic to where it is now. It's still a couple percentage points below what it was at um, pre-pandemic. Um, now, and that, and, and importantly, that, that has been, that has had some huge economic consequences. So employers in many cases have realized that that group of workers was hugely important because of their experience, because of their skill set, being very difficult to replace. So that's had big economic effects. I think another issue here, though, is if I think about that trend in a broader context of labor force participation among the 65 plus um, going back more decades, the drop that we see due to the pandemic, that two percentage point drop is dwarfed by the increase that we see prior to the pandemic. So if I look at 65 plus labor force participation um, going back into the early 90s, it was as low as about 10 or 11 percent um, of, of, of all people 65 plus in the United States. Up Leading up to the pandemic, that increase was into the low 20 percent. So it basically doubled in 30 years and then it dropped by a couple percentage points. So it's important, I think, to keep that scale um, in mind. Another important trend, I think, that came out of the pandemic that's important for workers of all ages um, is the labor force participation trends we've seen in the disabled um, community and, and among people that have disabilities, um, because that has been starkly different than the population of people without disabilities. So, for example, again, if I think about um, the workers that are 65 plus that don't have a disability, their drop in labor force participation has been has been significant and sustained. It's, it still has not recovered um, to, to, to what it was uh, before the pandemic. If I focus instead on the 65 plus population um, that does have a disability, um, their labor force participation did decline really sharply in the initial phase of the pandemic, but it's actually recovered and is now higher than it was before the pandemic. A big reason for this, and there's been a few articles published that talk about this phenomenon, both for older workers and for the population at large, is the expansion of remote work opportunities. And I think a really interesting sort of takeaway from that is, is always being willing to uh, challenge your assumptions about the nature of work. So before the pandemic, there was just widespread belief that remote work really only made sense for limited skill set, 
um, for a handful of workers and it, that it couldn't be applied on a large scale um, to have a productive workforce. Um, and then the pandemic happened and employers were forced to evolve. Um, so all these technologies that were already in place before the pandemic became more accessible. They also became better. And as a result, we now have a workforce that is much more able to work remotely. And employers have largely found that there are many, many um, positions that can be that can be uh, successfully completed remotely. And so that's opened up the door to millions of people in the, in, in um, millions of people with disabilities who previously wanted to work, but had that barrier in place that they couldn't access remote work because they just weren't adequate opportunities. Now that those opportunities exist, we see rising labor force participation among that group. I think that's an important lesson to take away for how we think about work in general. Always be looking to innovate. Quite fascinating. I would love to see uh, some of this data cross with socioeconomic classes. I know mm -hmm. that there's some who ask, like, are people working you know, more into the later years because they need to, have to, want to? Uh, that would be a fascinating conversation. I'm sure if there is that data um, in the report, uh, but let's talk about that after this. I would love to explore it with you. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. So um, what are some of the biggest barriers you think that older workers face in the labor market? So uh, it kind of alluding to, to some points made earlier, I think one big barrier is is um, is transitioning jobs. Um, it's just in general, a, 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 on average, a more difficult thing for older workers to do for a, a variety of reasons. Um, so, so I think one big thing that would benefit both those workers individually and businesses would be helping facilitate those transfers. And that goes to, that speaks to changing policies that relate to how do we evaluate um, people who, who, are, who, are, who are applying for positions. Um, those kinds of things I think are, are very important. Um, another challenge that older workers uh, face in the labor market is that oftentimes they have very diverse needs. You might have somebody who is in their early 60s who really does want to retire um, at 65, or maybe they want to retire um, early, we have to have policies and practices in place that work for that person and also work for a person who's the same age but wants to work another 15 years. Um, so understanding that older workers have this diversity of want in terms of what they want to get out of their work and how it fits within their life. Um, for example, we have uh, workers who are technically retired um, but enter and exit the labor force um, at a pretty high rate. They might come in, you know, during the summer and work a summer job because that's something that they like to do. Um, maybe they're, maybe they're, they're moving from uh, one, one location to another um, seasonally and they sometimes want to work, sometimes they don't want to work. Um, having a uh, environment in place that actually facilitates that um, for all the workers, but also for workers in general uh, would benefit, would benefit them and also employers, particularly in a labor market as tight as it currently is. Great. Um, so when you think about policies and employment practices that benefit older workers, like what are, what are some of the things we should be holding so that we're not really unduly impacting the rest of the workforce? Well, I think, I think that the way that question is framed is actually perfect. Um, because one thing that we, that we always talk about is that um, the innovations and the changes that we advocate for are things that help everybody. It's not about, uh, it's not about, um, I think oftentimes economics is viewed as a zero-sum game, that if I help a, a, a specific group, I have to be taking from another group. We actually find that that's completely not the case. Um, and, and the workforce is a really great way to illustrate that point. Um, so, for example, if I, if I think back to, um, uh, we talked about the great re resignation. Um, a, a lot of uh, uh, news articles, for example, in recent years have talked about um, older people staying in the workforce and that having this negative implication. Um, they've actually been blamed, for example, for for um, for rising inflation. They um, it's also come up that uh, that if somebody stays in the workforce longer, they're basically taking a job from a younger worker. And in reality, that's actually not at all true. Um, so, for example, if you have somebody in your business who's who's 65 or, or, or older. Um, and let's say they they retire, they move on to a new position. You're not going to replace that person with somebody who's come right out of college. That's just not how that works. We have we have groups of people who who have different roles, and somebody who's in that role at that age, they're doing something that's different from a younger worker who's just gaining experience and learning on the workforce. So there's that issue of just the misconception of of, of this idea that we have to be um, taking from one group to benefit another. Um, we really have policies. Uh, we really advocate for policies that benefit all workers. Um, and kind of to that point, um, going back to this idea of the multi-generational workforce, we find that workers in age-diverse environments are actually actually pre prefer that environment um, and are more productive because of it. 
Great. We do have a few questions moving around. Uh, there is something, okay? How can companies balance the need to keep up with changing market tactics and still targeting this population who still target this population who might engage with those new tactics much less? Um, I think the question really is around efficacy of approach mm -hmm. and uh, your thoughts there. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not a, an expert in marketing, um, obviously, but I would say just in general, um, there's this idea of, of you, the, the, the question mentions balancing a need. I, I would say that it's always important to re-examine what needs are you actually balancing and what are the costs of a particular approach. Um, so I think in general, obviously, any approach to, to, to marketing, any approach to your, to your um, business has to be well-researched. Um, I would just I would just encourage people not to have preconceived notions about what your group of people is. So if you're selling a, a product, for example, that that targets a younger audience because of the nature, maybe it's a tech product. Um, you know, we think about um, people that consume tech products as being dominantly younger. Um, I would say, again, that's that's a dated notion. If I actually look at the consumption of, of tech goods and services, um, the fastest growing groups are all older consumers. Part of that was the pandemic. Um, where, 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 where older adults decided that they wanted to adopt different types of technology because they wanted to communicate um, with their loved ones, with their friends in an environment of, of isolation. Um, but basically, um, I think that gets to the heart of the idea of you want to be thinking about all consumers as being very adaptable and older consumers are a really good example. So when you're thinking about, um, you know, what uh, what tack to take, what, what, what different um, initiative to, to take. Think about challenging your conception of, of what a particular group is. Fantastic. That resonates. My mother is in her mid eighties and um, she FaceTimes, she does Zoom for all of her mm -hmm. volunteer work did during the pandemic, uh, text messages, emails, just all the things. And she learned most of it from my son. So when my younger friends are like, oh, I can't figure it out. I'm like, call my mother, she'll help. <laughs> So, Justin, I want to take time for the audience to pose more questions. Uh, so can we open up for more Q&A? Absolutely. Please, I, I, I would love to hear more questions. Great. Well, while we wait for uh, questions to start coming in, um, one thing that I do know people often wonder is how the data that you're holding uh, shows up in disaggregation with men versus women or other uh, sort of demographics that uh, that you might have explored. I think that's a really, really interesting question. Um, and actually, we have a series of articles um, that I've, I've not mentioned specifically, but I've alluded to some of their findings um, that uh, that get to some of those issues and that actually we're going to expand upon in a report coming out in, in 2024. So the series is called Revelations Through Data. And the basic goal of each article is to use um, a, a publicly available data set to highlight something um, that's uh, maybe surprising about about uh, about older adults as a population. Maybe challenges a a, a sort of stereotype, um, or, or also draws parallels between older um, older adults and, and younger people in the fact that they often share the same goals, the same needs, all these things. Um, so you know, if 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 we look at a lot of those topics, so for example, one of the articles is on social isolation. One of them is on actually two of them are on work. Um, I mentioned uh, I mentioned prime working age. We have one about about thinking beyond prime working age. We have another one that's thinking about the pandemic and how it influenced uh, workers with disabilities. Um, if I break down a lot of those trends by something like uh, like race or ethnicity or something like gender, you see a few things. First, you would see that broadly speaking, there are a lot of parallel trends where people of of different races and ethnicities and different genders are experiencing the same thing. So, for example, labor force participation among older workers has gone up for every group of people, any any major racial ethnic category, men and women. If I look back to the to the early 90s to today, um, labor force participation among those who are 65 plus has increased in all those groups. There might be level differences between the groups, but the trend is always the same. Uh, similarly, that, uh, that, that, uh, that series has an article that will be published in about a month on parenting. Um, that article on parenting is talking about delayed childbearing and how uh, Children that are born today are disproportionately born to, to older mothers and fathers, mothers and fathers that are that are 30, 35, 40, even beyond. Um, that is also happening in every single demographic group. Um, it happens. Uh, it happens uh, that the trends are rising. Um, to, you know, it, by by education category, um, they're rising by by racial and ethnic status. Um, again, there's level differences, but everybody's trending in the same direction. So I think one thing that's interesting about these trends. Um, is that we see similar experiences across these groups. 
Um, however, there are also things that uh, that kind of come out that highlight the need to um, to kind of adapt policies, particularly because some groups are, 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 are vulnerable. One great example would be that workers in certain groups, socio socioeconomic especially, might find it much harder um, to, to uh, transfer jobs, for example, later in life. Um, a, a really good case is, um, and I'll just highlight this, this is not a, a necessarily a demographic category, but it's sort of a skills category, which I think is often correlated demographically. Um, if I have workers who are coming out of work um, because they're laid off, let's say that they're uh, job was uh, was uh, was downsized for due to technical change, so automation, for example, or for some other reason, their skill sets obsolete. Um, that group can face huge barriers to moving into new work, both because of their age, because of the age discrimination issue, discrimination issues that we've already talked about, and also because of in of their lack of access to resources. Um, so it can be extremely expensive to reskill, and extremely difficult if you're if you're an older um, adult trying to get those new skills. Um, so that can really affect um, particular uh, skill sets uh, disproportionately, and because those skill sets can those skill sets can be concentrated in particular demographic groups, um, we see some very strong impacts there. Um, so that's that, that, that's a big issue that uh, that w where improving policies and practices in those areas would really help a particular population of people um, who are who are in in desperate need of that help. Great, thank you. We have another question coming in. How can you educate employers about the benefit of hiring older adults? Well, from from my end, I, I think a big part of it is just pointing out these trends. Um, is is sort of just highlighting that um, that what you might have believed to be true in the past is is no longer the case, um, and, and basically that there's this pool of expertise, pool of of experience, and and, and workers that can that can benefit your firm. I think a lot of employers have just found that out by themselves out of necessity over these last few years. Um, but I think it's important to highlight that. Um, and, and the other thing is uh, to kind of, again, challenge this idea about what, if you're, if you're thinking about hiring um, a worker, what does that mean for your business and what are you going to get out of that investment? So I think a really interesting thing to highlight here is this idea of, uh, first off, sort of conceit, uh, traditional notions about how um, employees and their employers interact. So you might think that you know, 50 years ago there was this concept that you 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 come out of school, or you come out of your training, you get you hire you you, you get hired by an employer, and you stay with them for 35 years, um, and that's kind of your entire work experience. Um, that's really not the case anymore. That it's it's much much more likely now that um, for younger workers we see very very active job hopping, where you might come out of the labor force. You might work for a couple years for several different employers, and your career is really um, morphed into a situation where you're actually having many jobs, maybe even many different skill sets. Um, so the actual, um, if, if I'm an employer and I'm thinking about hiring a younger person, I now have to very consistently think, this person might be moving on in just a couple of years. Um, so so the investment, the, the return on that investment is, is very different than it might have been. Um, it, you know, in prior generations. And that actually motivates one reason why, why older workers are an interesting group to look at. Because if you're thinking about hiring somebody in their 60s, first off, they're much more likely now than it was the case in the past to work longer. Um, and you actually might get more years of, 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 of labor out of that group than you would out of a younger person um, who might have different goals in terms of how long they want to stay in the job. Um, again, it's important not to apply um, any type of stereotype to somebody of any age. It's just important to think um, in a in a constructive, um, objective way about what workers might want, and to ask those questions and to explore those opportunities. Fantastic. So we've spoken from the perspective of looking at this population. What are your thoughts on what we should be sharing with this population about how to think about being in the workforce, participating in the economy in a powerful, uh, effective way? You know, I think I think one thing that's interesting to me. Um, I, I was, for, first off, I, I think that there are sometimes stereotypes that that exist for people even about themselves that are that are that are negative that that reduce their um that reduce their ability to live the life that they want to live. So that's that is one thing is 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 having a message of empowerment for for, for older people, like knowing that that you can succeed if you want to change careers, if you want to. Um, do you know whatever objectives you have in your life that there are resources that you can um, that you can avail yourself of that that will help you achieve those goals? I think that message is really important. Um, but I think another message that's really important is that um, 
groups in general and, and older workers and older adults in general have, have kind of have, have mirrored this. They are very, very um, dynamic and very adaptable at an individual level. So a great example would be uh, the increasing labor force participation of the 65 plus population since the 90s. I mean, I'm talking now 30 years later about policies and practices that should be in place to help that group of people. And they've done this all by themselves. They've doubled their labor force participation without really without really having any kind of outside force helping them achieve that goal. There are still these barriers in place that were that existed uh, three decades ago. So even in the face of all those obstacles, we have this group showing this dynamism and this ability to overcome barriers. Um, and so I think that's an important thing is that it's not necessarily about um, basically individual action always leads uh, policy change and 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 practice change. Um, recognizing the value of that group and how they've changed and how um, they can contribute, I think that's a key to starting to understand how you can um, benefit as, as as an employer, as a policymaker, as society at large. Great. Another question has come in. Is there any data about the risk of AI, uh, human resource bots, shifting out older adults? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, one huge issue here is is the, the big unknown is, is what AI, uh, what will the role of AI be in changing what a worker does of, of, of any age? And I think, you know, one thing that, that doesn't get talked about enough in terms of AI conversations is that the presence of AI in terms of a, 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 a machine doing something that a human used to do, that's a that dates back to the dawn of the industrial revolution and even before. So before people, um, before the steam shovel, people used regular shovels to, to dig holes. Um, and when the steam shovel came along, that replaced workers and it changed what workers do. Um, so I think there is this idea that, um, there, there, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that AI, as we talk about it now, is an evolution of a trend that's existed for a very, very long time. And, and, and labor has evolved to, to meet the nature of that trend. Now, I do think that that what's happening in AI right now is very new in that um, it's a real leap forward in what um, can be automated and what types of skills can be automated. So, you know, we think about um, automation historically as being kind of routine labor, um, something that a machine can do just because it's a it's something that's repetitive and, and something that can be automated. Um, now we think about AI as being um, as being potentially able to replace very non-routine labor. Um, and that's a very new thing. Um, so in terms of affecting the workers that might get affected, I think generally speaking, what I would say, we actually have a, a paper that we're working on right now. It's still in a draft form, but it's thinking about the future of work um, and looking at uh, projections for the growth of employment opportunities in different occupations. And what we generally find is that those, those projections, which account for things like uh, like skills ops, obsolescence and other things, um, they they don't tend on average they don't really say that older workers are any more threatened by something like automation relative to their younger counterparts. There are definitely occupations out there um, that we expect to decline because of their risk of automation. Um, a, a good example would be um, telephone operators. I mean that's already an extremely rare um, job now. It used to be very very common, um, but it should it, it will very likely disappear sometime within the next ten to twenty years. Um, but Older workers don't tend to be um, over concentrated in that set relative to the younger counterparts. Um, there are certain there are certain skill sets where older workers are very prominent, um, and, and that skill set doesn't have a great outlook. But there are also similar skill sets where younger workers are the dominant group, and and their outlook is is poor. Great, thank you so much for that, Justin. Um, we are coming up on time, and I just want to thank you for sharing so much about. Uh, the longevity economy. We've learned quite a bit around uh, the, the elements of the global workforce, the global economy, and what that means uh, for various uh, countries around the world, whether they are the more mature economies or those with the younger populations. You've helped us understand how businesses and policymakers should be thinking about the economy and the participants who are older uh, workers and adults. And you've helped us remember that. Um, skills really matter and that we should be holding on to the evolution of skills without fear of science or technology. As we move to a close, we'd like to thank you for your time and invite you to share a few closing remarks. Thank you so much, Dimitri. It's been a joy having this conversation with you. And again, thank you to everybody um, for, for attending. Thank you to SOCAP for putting this webinar on. Um, I really enjoy having these kinds of conversations. I think they're really important and they help us move forward in important areas.
Um, I, I, I want to close very quickly um, by just um, highlighting some resources for, for the audience. Um, so I've, I've done this with some QR codes here. Um, so I talked about the global longevity economy outlook today. That was all the work that related to older consumers around the world. Um, so if you want to read that report, um, the, uh, the uh, QR code on the, on the left will, will provide that resource for you. That'll direct you straight to that. Um, this is a very long, it's a, it's a long report. It's, it's you know, 80, 90 pages long, covers a lot of information. Um, one thing that uh, we find people often enjoy is just digging into that data themselves. As I mentioned, there are 76 individual economies covered. We also have global estimates for things like consumer spending, uh, for GDP impact, employment impact, labor income impact. It's a lot of data and a lot of times people want to look at it in, in whatever, you know, at their own pace or they want to look at a particular region. There's a great website. Uh, if you go to the uh, Explore the Data QR code, we have a lot of Tableau visualization tools that allow you to look at things like trends over time for a specific economy for a particular outcome. Um, there's a lot of very interesting um, stuff there. So I, I encourage you to, uh, to, to look at that website if, if you want to sort of dig into the data in a deeper or maybe more specific way. Um, other longevity economy reports that I think are really relevant to the conversation we had today, we have two that talk about workers in, in some interesting ways. So one of them is the economic impact of age discrimination. Um, that report is basically uh, about um, how age discrimination that older workers face um, in the labor market. It could be things like, uh, like a lack of opportunity to be rehired, uh, early retirements, either implicitly or explicitly. Um, the economic costs of that tend to be very broad, um, not just for the individuals who are actually experiencing that discrimination, um, but for their families and for society at large, and even for the employers that are that, that are engaging in that. So that's a really interesting report. Um, another really interesting report um, is the um, is this one on the on the right here, the economic impact of supporting working family caregivers. I think this is a really interesting report on our end. Um, both because it tackles caregiving and its relationship to work in a way that I think um, is, is very novel and, and doesn't get enough attention. Um, and also it covers all caregivers. And I think one, it, one really interesting issue with caregiving is that it increasingly covers a very, very broad age spectrum. So, so fa working family caregivers might be um, young parents raising children. It might be middle-aged parents who are simultaneously raising their children and caring for, for, for an older loved one, as like a mother and father, for example. And it also increasingly includes uh, workers who are older who maybe are caring, uh, working and also caring for their spouse or, or their loved one or, or, or another family member. Um, so it's a very interesting paper and it covers caregivers um, of every age and, and the economic benefits that, that are achieved by, by supporting that population. Finally, um, I mentioned the series Revelations Through Data. There are two articles in it. Um, there, there, four have been published. Actually, one was published just yesterday. Um, six will be published ultimately. We have two additional ones coming in January. Um, but the two articles that I think most relate to today's conversation are Thinking Beyond Prime Working Age. That's a QR code here on the left. And just yesterday, we published COVID-19 and labor force participation among people with disabilities. It's a very interesting article, um, and that is on the right. So um, for those are additional resources that you can look to. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it, it, of course, you can always go to AARP's website in general. We have a lot of other really interesting work um, to examine. Thank you very much, Justin. It's been a pleasure.